Hey, Riverfront family. We're coming at you this week with a special bonus episode. It is episode one of a new Riverfront interview show, Red Leg Roundtable, brought to you by our very own Ohio native, Seth Shaner. Seth recently had the pleasure of sitting down with former Cincinnati Reds catcher, Eddie Toppenzi, and during their hour-long conversation, they covered Eddie's path to the big leagues, his time with the Reds, and went into detail on that 1999 Red Leg squad that won the hearts of every Reds fan fortunate enough to watch and listen to them play. We're grateful to Eddie for his willingness to have this chat and grateful to Seth for making it happen. Seth plans to bring us more similar content with regularity going forward, and we could not possibly be more excited to have him on board over at the Riverfront. So without further ado, please enjoy Seth Shaner as he welcomes Eddie Toppenzi to the Red Leg Roundtable. Hello and welcome to the first edition of the Red Leg Roundtable podcast. I'm your host, Seth Shaner. The Red Leg Roundtable podcast is an interview show centered around the Cincinnati Reds and their great history. The goal of the show is to talk to folks who have played for or worked for the Cincinnati Reds, or even those with unique stories to share about the team, the city of Cincinnati, and the stadiums they have played in. And with this being 2024, 25 years since the 1999 Reds thrilled their fans with a surprising 96-win season, I want to feature stories from that magical year. To kick off the endeavor, I am excited to welcome former Reds catcher and current college coach Eddie Tobinsey to the Red Leg Roundtable. Eddie, thanks so much for joining me today. Seth, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for letting, inviting me. All right. Obviously, as I mentioned to you earlier, the 1999 season is a big focus of this podcast, especially for this year, 2024. Can you believe it's been 25 years since that season? No. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That, 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 is, that, that is crazy. It's just it, the years go by so fast. Um, and, and to be honest, Seth, yeah, when it, things like that, when I think about seasons like that and you know accomplishments and, and 25 years goes by and people still talk about it, it goes – it really reminds me of how – kind of how special that was and, and to be a part of a team, even though we didn't go to the, make the playoffs, but it's such an amazing year, an amazing run, it, it just it feels really good. Yeah, no doubt about it. And as I mentioned to you off the air, my favorite season as a whole, and that's why – Sometimes, you know, you get in this caught in this uh, world where we have Twitter and we have social media and everybody wants, to, you know, everything right away and all that. And sometimes it's good to remind yourself that the journey is part of the, the fun. And certainly that year, I mean, I could tell you stories and maybe we'll get into some of them of me, you know, even I had to go back to my, my college roommate's hometown of Dayton, Ohio, from Ohio State to get a couch, you know, as we were moving into the campus and we've got the game on and, and Marty Brenneman's describing Scott Williamson kind of being a little bit wild, but still getting guys out. <laughs> oh, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. he, he was a, he, you know what? A little bit wild, but really good. Yeah, certainly. Of a rookie of the year, he deserved it completely that year. Um uh, so I guess let's talk a little bit about you. You were born on Halloween in 1968. Uh, baseball Reference says you were born in Beeville, Texas, but that you graduated high school at Lake Howe High School in Winter Park, Florida. Take me through kind of your formative years and where you grew up. Yeah, well, basically I was just born in Texas at Beeville. Back then, back in the late 60s, Beeville, Texas was a – a naval training camp for the Navy. My dad was stationed in the Navy, and uh, I was born there. Um, we lived in Ohio for a little bit, in Springfield, Ohio. That's okay. where my mom's from. And and when I was about a year and a half old, moved to Florida. My dad, you know, decided to move the whole family. Just well, not whole family. It's a really small family. Just me and my parents, and uh, the Florida where it's nice and warm. And I'd been there since ever since I was about a year and a half old, a year old. And so I'm a Floridian, been there well over 50 years. And until recently, until the last six months, moved to to South Carolina, the Greenville area, South Carolina, where the total change of scenery, pace, and, and really enjoying it. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So certainly the advantage is built into year-round nicer weather and things like that. You grow up in Winter Park. Um, you actually, it was kind of ser serendipitous that you were, you were drafted by the Reds in 86 and, and certainly you didn't end up at the big league level with them until later, but, but talk about being drafted in the sixth round back in 1986. 
Yeah, it, you know, baseball back then was so different than it is now um, for a couple of reasons. There's no such thing as travel ball. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no such thing as that. So, you know, your high school, you know, and all-stars after like Little League and things like that were really good baseball, really good competition. And um, you, you're just hoping your high school coach was a good coach, could teach you. And there wasn't many just – academies around you know you had to find hopefully find somebody to, to, to teach you the swing teach you little things and, and to be honest a lot of times you, you just you're playing with your friends outside you figuring things out you're just playing and, and, and having fun um but yeah i got drafted out of high school when i was i was a 16 year old senior wow i was a, a young high schooler and t- just turned 17 during my senior year um and and drafted by the reds you know back then the scouts had to come find you so during playing fall ball playing playing in the spring there there have been been games where we have you know multiple over 20 scouts almost every team represented in fact you know not only come to see me but they were were playing against a team who had a kid who was drafted the next year second in the nation right behind King Griffey Jr. His okay. name was Mark Mer- his name was Mark Merchant. He was supposed to be the next kind of Mickey Mantle. <laughs> He's second he was second pick in the draft. So when we played that team, boy, there were scouts just uh, all over the place. Not only for him, but to see to see guys like myself. Okay. Well so you end up making the rounds around uh the minor leagues, but in on May eighteenth, nineteen ninety one, you make your major league debut for the Cleveland <laughs> Indians. Um, describe that a little bit and kind of the circumstances behind getting called up and things like that. Yeah, that was, that was very interesting because I got drafted by the Reds, spent five years in the minors with them and did, did had my ups and downs as a, as a young guy, but it did had years where I did really, really well. And I was on the 40 man roster at one time. And then one year having a, I had a bounce back year in the minors thought thinking I was going to be put back on the 40 man to get back in on on kind of the main prospect list with the Reds. And what happened, they, they put me on a triple a roster that year. Um, and so what happened, I got picked up with what's called a rule five draft mm-hmm. in, in the off season. So which a team that picked me off triple a roster, they had to keep me in the big leagues all, all a whole year or send me back. And people don't realize, I really don't talk about it. I was picked up by the Oakland A's oh. in the rule five draft. So in 1991, I went to spring training with the Oakland A's, you know, if they were going to keep me, I had to be like their third catcher in the big leagues or somehow they could get me through the minor leagues. And so this is right after the Reds had beaten them in the World Series in 1990. So I went from a ball in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where I was an all star, hit 16 homers, I think driving in like 60 something RBIs and having a good year for a young play. Then I find myself in the spring training with Mark McGuire, <laughs> Ricky Henderson, Jose Canseco, Terry Steinbeck, you know, all that great team of the, of the A's thinking, oh, my gosh, am I going to be on this team? And I had a great spring training with them, really did well. And Tony Russo, and I remember going the last game of the season in spring training was the Bay Bridge Series. We flew to Oakland to play the, the Giants. And I remember flying into Oakland, walking into the, the clubhouse of the A's, I never got to see the field. Tony Larusa called me into my into the log into his office, and he says, "Eddie, you know it's the last day of spring training. Where hopefully the rosters were all set for all the teams. Said we tried to sneak you through waivers so we could put you down on our AAA team, but the Cleveland Indians picked you up off of waivers. And I went from right to there to Cleveland. I went to the big leagues. I opened up in the big leagues in Kansas City for four days." And I went from A ball to the big leagues with Cleve. I'm sitting there opening day. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the most awesome thing in, in the world. Please don't put me in the game. <laughs> you know, and but then then from there they they were able to put me through waivers after a few days in the big league season. I, I was triple A with the big leagues. I went I skipped double A, went to triple A with the Indians, had a really good year, hit 310 in the minors with them. Um and it's just up and down a little bit during the season because Sandy Alomar would get hurt and I got in, in May, got called up, then went back down to finish the year, and got called back up in September. So that's how I got to the Indians. I was picked up off of waivers from the Oakland A's, and I don't talk about be playing for the A's a lot because I, I it was such a quick thing in spring training, and yeah. I never got a chance to be in the minors with them or to the big leagues. Well, that is a, a that's an amazing story. I didn't know, and 
and my friends would tell me that I know most everything about anybody who played for the Reds. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, a little bit of trivia, though. You were involved in a trade with the Astros, and and the Indians in return got Kenny Lofton. So uh, yeah, that that worked out for the Indians, and you end up going to Houston. Actually, it worked out amazing for both of us because as I was – Houston Astros at the time, they had a great center field. They had an amazing career. Steve Finley, uh-huh. you know, Steve Finley, a great, he had over 300 homers in his career, gold glover, everything. Um, but they had, they had a great catcher who, who was, you know what, they wanted to get him behind the plate and put him at second base was Craig Bishop. That's right. That's right. And, and, and so and play, playing again, when I was with the Indians in AAA, we played against the Houston, the Tucson Toros was the Houston Astros. So I had some good games against them. And uh, so, Myself and a guy uh, named Dave Rohde, uh no, no, not Willie Blair and I were with the Indians, and we both got traded for Kenny Lofton and Dave Rohde. Okay. So it was like a two for two. It was two for two. It wasn't a one for one, Eddie Thomas, for Kenny, but that was kind of the main thing mm-hmm. because uh, they were moving Biggio to second base, and so they wanted me to come in, a young player, and, and so to – to do well, and so um, that, that was to me that that was exciting for me. It got it, Kenny Lofton. People ask me what it feels like to be Clint Trey. I said, I think it's awesome because I came a couple things. It got me to the big leagues a year or two early. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the big leagues at 22 years old. And, you know, and, and so, and later on in 2001, I went back to the Indians. I got the chance to play with Kenny. Yeah. And, and so we got to become teammates. And to me, um, I I love it. It was the best thing for me. I mean, I I needed to, I was stuck behind Sandy Alomar Jr. I got a chance to, to platoon with Scott Service with the Astros and, you know, I was getting, I was getting better each, every year. I, I struggled the first year, got better the next year. I'm still a young guy, but for some reason, the Astros, you know, obviously Kenny Lofton just took off. Um, and, you know, I'm still developing slow. And then the Reds, Joe Oliver with the Reds in 94, he, he got, he got, he came down with um, some kind of freak, injury and not an injury but more of a of a condition like a disease something happened where he was out and and not and they traded and i got back to the reds in 94 they traded for me and uh, i was able to get back and, and those seven years with the reds that's where i blossomed mm-hmm. as, as a hitter and as a player i got a chance to do the things i thought i was capable of doing yeah 94 you get traded to the reds in the middle of the se- or in the season and you you hit 294 your on base was 345 uh, yep. just to, in, in the modern, the modern parlance, the OPS plus, if you're over a hundred, you're good. You were at 118. So certainly a, a, a good first stop with the Reds. And I've got a little bit more trivia before we move it along is because I really want to dive into 1999 more than, than anything at this point. But yes, you had the last postseason hit for the Reds in the 1995 playoffs. They didn't have another postseason hit until 2010. So yeah, I remember. I remember that somebody told me because they got no hits. The right, first game they did get the no hits. <laughs> Roy Halladay. And when they finally got the hit, they said the last player knew was me, and uh, and I came. I remember coming in, and I was. I always have fun with the kids in college. The college team. I said, you know, Coach Thomas in '95, I hit 500 in the playoffs. One for. They go really. I said, yeah, I was one for two. And and they start laughing. And I'm like, well, how many hits you guys got? I, you know, <laughs> so maybe maybe they should have played me more. And we would have done better. But no, the, the Braves Braves were were the team that year for sure. Boy, that was something else. I was at um, one of the home games, and it felt like Barry Larkin lived on third base in that series, and nobody could knock him in. But uh, so. yeah, that's what it was. There was some, you know, when, when it happens in close games, and uh, yeah, we we had our chance. But that's that's what the that pitching always kind of seems right. to come, come through. Okay. So you played over a hundred games in 96 and 97 mm-hmm. for the Reds and 98, 99, you're, you're basically the starting catcher, the primary catcher, I guess would be the best way yeah. to put it. Um, in 99, you had your best season. We're going to talk about that overall, but, but you, you batted three eleven, a three fifty four on base, five twenty one slugging, uh, just a great numbers, 21 home runs, 87 RBI, 22 doubles. Again, OPS plus a one sixteen. Um, certainly that, I guess that was your peak year, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly was. And, and the year before was, was a big year too. And the, I, I credit that to Jack McKeon. That's when he came over. Mm-hmm. And when he came over, he believed in me. He let me play every single day. And, um, and so, and I started playing every day in, in 98 and it was, it was, it was such a great thing. And, 
it was, it was such an amazing thing and, and kind of scary thing because the first month and a half of the season in 1998 for me um almost first few months i was leading the national league in hitting yes i was so on fire <laughs> was, and you know i got a, i got a clipping where it says eddie Thompson, like tony Gwynn, and john olerud i'm like <laughs> What's going on here? And and I was so hot, and they were talking about me being an all star and things like that. I was like, whoa! I said I've never been an all star since minor leagues. But anyhow, I did have a good year. But that year, I, I kind of I did something to my wrist, and I was playing hurt the whole year, where I lost a little power. And if I missed the ball, it really hurt the swing, but it didn't hurt me to throw. And and, and it hurt me with the power numbers, but I was able to drive in runs and do that. But um, in that off season was really huge it, I, it never healed and it's funny about a month before spring training it was still bothering me i was panicking and we ended up having to go in a doctor had to go in and clean it out i had to do some cleaning out with some some stuff in my wrist and and fix some things and it was it wasn't about two weeks before spring training i started hitting off a tee a little bit a week before and throwing and then that's the first time i picked up a ball and it started feeling better i went so i went into spring training in 99 coming off a of surgery on my wrist and all I did was hit off the tee for a week and, and play catch one time. And I was, I was ready to go. And, and, and I came in having my, my best year. So um, that, that was a big deal. Uh, Cause I, I, I was playing hurt that year cause I didn't want to disappoint Jack and I didn't, you know, I wanted to play, keep, keep on playing. And, sure. uh, and plus I had a year in me, I had to get used to playing every day you know, cause you know, before I was platooning and doing well, and then man, and just the grind of, Catching 120, 130 games, 125 games is a lot. It's a toll on the body, mm -hmm. and so, and so doing that the next year, coming back and uh, being stronger and and just being able to do more durable. It just I was able to put up the numbers I thought I was capable of. Of those years before, if you see me platooning, hitting 290, 12 homers, driving in 44 runs or so. I mean, I just be able. I just basically doubled the numbers that I did playing part time. Yeah, so definitely. I was glad. You Stuff proved you were consistent, thing. right? You, I mean, that, that, yeah, so that was it. I told people I was a very productive – for those two years, I got a chance to play every day. I was dri averaging about 80 runs driving in a year. Mm -hmm. And you can't you – that, that's awesome for a catcher. And then 2000 came along. I started off the year really good, but then I blew my back out. I was kind of never the same since. Okay, okay. We're going to uh, really dive into 1999, 25 years since that great season. Well, first of all, I want to tell one story – um, in 2012, I'm, I'm in Florida with my wife and son. We're visiting my in-laws who, who wintered down there. And uh, my, my father and I go to an Astros spring training game against the Mets in Kissimmee. And um, I'm wearing a wire-to-wire -wire Reds t-shirt. And mm -hmm. this, this man walks up to me and points at my shirt and says, I played for them. And I looked down at my shirt, and I look up, and immediately I said, you're Eddie Tobinsey. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that story. I'm sure you don't remember it, but uh, I, I re my recall was pretty quick because I was like, wait a minute, this is a 1990 red shirt, but no, no, that's Eddie Tobinsey. <laughs> Yeah, well, that yeah, that, that, I, I don't remember, but if I was there in 2012, I was working for a, a, a ministry to, to professional ball players then, and I was visiting all the teams. Okay. I just happened to be visiting – the Astros that day. All right. All right. Well then fast forward to now. Um, tell me a little bit about now. I know you, your son, Matt is a pitcher for North Greenville university and you've signed on and you mentioned already, you've moved up there. You, your residence now, uh, you, you're a volunteer assistant for North Greenville university. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. North Greenville university is a division two baseball program. Um, over the past five years, they've been ranked number one over over the years. And two years ago, they they won the the national championship, the D two national championship. And last year, I was, I was helped volunteering coach. We lost in the World Series. Uh, I came like third or fourth in the nation. And um, you know, this year we're we're trying to get back there again. And so, I have I have a son who's a big left handed pitcher. Um, he's he's really good. He led our team in earned run average last year, so he's coming back for his last year to finish strong and uh, hopefully, you know, aspirations of you, know, you never know go on to the next level somehow. Oh yeah, and the picture um, on North Greenville's website announcing you signing on to volunteer as a coach. You're wearing a t shirt with the it's got the old school White Sox logo with NGU underneath it. That's that's a really neat logo on that shirt. 
Really? Okay. I didn't think I, I got to go, go, go check, check it out. So let's see, we'll see what picture. Did. But yeah, I, I, I enjoyed, I, I really enjoy volunteering and, and I, I love it up here because the head coach is a guy named Landon Powell is a big league catcher with the Oakland A's caught a perfect game with, with the A's. And, um, I just, I just come up here and just volunteer the days that I want to do the things I want to do and just, bring whatever I can to the team. And he loves having me around and I love being around the coaches and the kids. Okay. That's, that's so cool. And we'll, I'm, I'm going to keep track this spring and see how things go. That sounds like an exciting year coming up. Um, we're diving into 1999. I want to just go kind of point by point. Um, and then at the end, I want to just, I want to get your take on some of your teammates in the seasons you guys had, but you went Let's 96 and 67 that year. The, yeah. the, the one extra game is the one game playoff to the Mets. We'll get to that as, we go through the season. Um, when you went to spring training that year, uh, we'll get into some of the changes, but but certainly you can't put on a board and say, we're going to win 96 games. But what was the vibe? Do you remember what it was like in spring training that year, how it might have been a little different around the room? Well, you know, we knew it was different for one reason. We were excited about the year because we had facial hair. <laughs> and and because we we had signed Greg Vaughn that's right from the San, from the San Diego Padres so that to be honest that was the most exciting thing about spring training is everybody if you probably look at the that year everybody had I had a goatee and everybody was having, most everybody was trying to grow some facial hair because Greg Vaughn was coming over and and he he wasn't going to come over unless he could have his goatee so hey having Greg Vaughn around we knew. We knew we were going to be competitive, and with the division we were in the Central, that um, you know things come together. You know, hitting wise and talent wise, we knew with you know with with Casey and Larkin and Vaughn, you know, we we had some some hitters. But what the big thing was 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 good about it is is the players like myself, Pokey Reese, Aaron Boone. We had we had Dimitri Young and others just. We all kind of played to our potential. We stay healthy. We, we stayed together, and and in our, our really our our pitching. If you look at our pitching staff, you look well. There's not like one huge big name, but we we had guys who, especially if it's starters, good enough starters that they stay healthy. They they're quality major league pitchers. But then is really our bullpen was mm-hmm. really strong that year. That Absolutely. really re- really really solidified our pitching staff. Now, now Vaughn and Mike Cameron were new to the team that year. They both came over in trades. Vaughn had hit 50 home runs and gone to the World Series yeah. with the Padres the year before. Um, but but they come over in trades, Cameron for uh, Paul Canerco, and there was a glut at first base. And uh, I guess I remember um, I remember sitting up the, the night before the <clears throat> season, or maybe it was right before you would have departed Florida to go north, and baseball tonight had Greg Vaughn and Mike Cameron on set and they interviewed the two of them. And I thought, my goodness, even I was just, I was actually, I guess, a, um, I, I don't know if I, I must've been home with my parents or something. I was a, a college student and I just remember thinking, wow, this guy seems different. And I don't know, you know, winners can say team chemistry matters. And then people say, yeah, but what about the losing teams that all got along? Well, what, what happened there? But but Greg Vaughn, he came in and seemed to set a tone. Was that true? Was that kind of the media narrative? Was that true? He certainly did set a tone. But Barry Larkin was our captain. He uh-huh. was he was he was everything to us. Barry Larkin. He he set the table uh, how to play, how to be a red. Uh, but Greg Vaughn brought the intensity. Mm-hmm. He brought the intensity, and you know what? He hated to lose, and it's one of those things that, man, after getting you lost, man, you you, you just didn't want to hear. You, <laughs> he he let everybody know, and it. it was it's not a good feeling because you know he he's just been to the World Series. He wants to get back there again, and and so and so really, we learned a lot as young players, my myself and others. You know, all good, really good talent, but we learned how to grind, how to fight and, and just, just kind of how, just kind of really go, go in every day thinking there's no thinking there's no team. We don't care who's pitching, who's out there, that we have a shot. We should beat them. Sure. And well, to your point there, the pitching staff, which you had to handle as the primary catcher, Pete Harnish, Denny Nagel, Nagel had some injury time that year, 
Brett Tomko was a young starter. Um, Ron mm-hmm. Valone, you talk about grinders. Uh, he, yeah. he went toe to toe with Randy Johnson, won a one nothing game. He had, he had games where he only gave up one hit over seven or eight innings. Steve Paris was an unsung hero that year. And of course you mentioned the bullpen. Danny Graves was the primary closer, but Scott Williamson was rookie of the year. And my goodness, nobody could touch him. Talk a little bit about the staff as a whole and maybe some individual guys. Yeah, no, the, the staff was, was was good. I mean, you know, Pete Harnish was kind of our our, our workhorse in a, in, a, in a lot of ways because if he stayed healthy, you knew you, you kind of knew every what you're going to get out of him every every inning, every every outing. You know, he's just he's going to if he's hitting his spots, things like that. He's going to he's going to give you a chance. He's going to give you five plus innings, and mm-hmm. uh, he won 16 games for us that year, and. Um, you know, Tomko was young and he, he came in there, you know, he's still learning how to pitch, but he came in there and he had some, he had some electric stuff as a starter. Um, but obviously we, we had a lot of veterans and obviously Malone, he, he kind of did a delivery. He, he starts and he relieve a little bit later on too, but, uh, he was strong. He gave us some big, big innings and big games and, and he came, he showed up when we needed him and he was, he was really durable. That, that year, but as Steve Paris, as you said, he was he was a hunt sung here. You know, it's something you were going to say he was going to go eleven and four that year with like a three and a half Ernie around there. Mm-hmm. You would have said really, yeah, you because know, he he kind of you would you kind of think of him more of a as a, just kind of like a stock pitcher. So so, but basically that year he he put it together for us that year, and uh, obviously with with our hitting, we scored some runs, made him feel comfortable, and. um and so we, we had, you know, we always had a lot of guys too, you know, we, with, with Avery, we had Juan Guzman, you That's know, right. veteran type of guys who kind of like, you know, can they come back? They're coming off of injuries and, you know, trying to get their stuff back again. Cause that fact, you know, Juan Guzman did really well for us that year, but I think he got hurt. And yeah, later, later on, or did we trade him? I don't remember. Well, Guzman, I, yeah, Guzman, he made 12 starts. He basically came after at the trade deadline. He made 12 starts yeah. at a 303 ERA, but I do think he he ran out of gas late. Um, yeah, if and, I remember uh, right because because I don't I don't remember how in the playoffs we're going to use him. But if you think about it, we had, we had no starting pitcher go over 200 innings. Nope. Um, One night we had three. Yeah, we had three get three relievers. Oh, you know, we had a couple of in the hundreds, and 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 I think probably Scott Williamson was pretty close to a hundred innings pitch. So, so you could see what Jack did. There. Boy, he 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 liked to bring in those bullpen with three guys over you know, around a hundred innings in the bullpen. He really, our bullpen really carried us a lot. That we had a really good bullpen. We had, those guys in the bullpen, their earned run average was probably a good run less. Than that our starters they were and Danny Graves had 111 innings um and then Scott Sullivan 113 I think he actually had like three years in a row with over 100 innings which is you know people today wouldn't believe because you just don't see relievers throwing that kind of innings and then Williamson had 93 innings and you're right they, they were all uh Williamson had a 241 ERA Sullivan 301 Graves was 3.08 uh, just mm-hmm. yeah, really amazing. And young Dennis Reyes, three point seven nine. Yeah, yeah. Gabe he, White he was, was he was a lefty. He was mm-hmm. nasty. He just he just carve up other lefties. He he had really good stuff. His ball never went straight. Well, and people you know people will bemoan maybe Jim Bowden in, in kind of his era as Reds general manager, but he made that trade. He got Dennis Reyes and Paul Konerko. He spun Konerko for Mike Cameron, and Dennis Reyes was a a bit of a good find there for two or three years. He's pretty young too at the time. He was only 22 in that year in 1999. So uh, certainly a a, a big help for, for your team. Um, You started not super fast, but then you go 18 and nine in June. Um, We're going to go through the season a little bit, but the crazy thing to me is even though you did not go to the playoffs, you went 19 and nine in September. So you didn't wilt down the stretch. That was a, a very fun month of September trying to get in the playoffs. Uh, Hal McCoy from the Dayton Daily News called you the big road machine. You went fifty-one and thirty on the road. Yeah, we we certainly did. Yeah, it's funny you talk about you know the month of April. We're just kind of a finding out kind of who we were. I mean, I don't think we even had a good April. We're I think we're below five hundred in April, and we're just you know we're just kind of okay. We're trying to find ourselves and figure things out, and and really. 
started starting in May and, and June, we really started to get it together. And I tell you what, there, I think, I think our, I think in, in June, we really, we really, we really started to, 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 to do it. And I think we had a couple streaks where we won about eight or nine, 10 games in a row, but it was right. I tell you when we really believed we like, we we could win this thing this whole thing is because we started playing good it was right before the all-star break in mm -hmm. late june we were playing we had a 10 game series where we played arizona and houston for 10 straight games right right and we won them all and there are these are all first place teams and and we want we won them all and we went into the the all-star break and we thought oh my gosh we we just we just ran through arizona and houston and 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 we, I said we will come back like let's do this the second half of the year let let let's do it that that's that's really I think where we started kicking in and, and really we had a better second half I th I believe in the first half oh yeah you certainly did and, and to your point um, you were nine and twelve in April but then you went sixteen and ten eighteen and nine sixteen and twelve yep. seventeen and twelve and then I mentioned nineteen in and September nine. yeah September we rocked in September but the the bad part is so did Houston they did they did they were right there you were you were a game ahead or a game behind the whole month it felt like absolutely yeah, and 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 so did the Mets mm -hmm, unfortunately so <laughs> the, all, all those all those teams had a great September and sure. which was horrible I mean what kept us in it but also it just made for an amazing fight down the end. Well, hey, I've, I've taken down a few key games. You mentioned that late stretch, and, and I have baseball reference up now. That You're absolutely right, Arizona and Houston. And, and I remember they made a big deal out of the West Coast road trip. I think you had a 9 and one trip there at one point, and that was always yep. – That's the local media would say, well, they're doing okay, but they, they've got a nine-gamer out West coming up because they were kind of scarred by all the years the Reds played in NL West, you know, and, and they had to go out West, and it was a time change and all that and playing so many games out there, but – let me go through um, a few highlights I've put down, and if you remember any different, you can bring those up as well. But okay. Friday, April 16th, we mentioned you didn't have the best April, but you had a walk-off win against Pittsburgh, and it may have been the first time, and remember this, they called it the stomp, where nobody had really yes. done this before. Take me through the genesis of celebrating at home plate for when somebody had a walk-off win. Okay, okay. I talk about this with my wife all the time, <laughs> and um, it's funny. I think Aaron Boone could confirm this because Aaron Boone was there. I, I forget who 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 hit the home. Was it Sean Casey or was somebody? Was it a game winning homer? Game winning hit? Let me pull this up okay. here. I don't know if that's the game, but that's your first walk off win of the year. Yeah, it's a walk off. But I remember going to home plate and and the person scoring the it's a walk off homer for sure. Uh huh. And 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 so as they were rounding, I remember being at home plate, and it was like we're just all like gathered around it. And I remember, you know, I, I'm I, I remember it's like let's jump up and down, you know, <laughs> I, and jump and start jumping up and down. We all just started jumping up and down, and and that's to me, I, that's that's how it started. I. I want, you know, I, I, I want to, I guess I want to say, I think I started it. I want to <laughs> say, I think I started it. Cause I remember saying that doing that and we just started jumping up and down. And, um, I think it was Aaron Boone maybe hit the homer. Aaron Boone was a part of it somehow. Okay. Yeah. I've, that one yeah, was like, a Hal Morris double. Uh, so, so it must not have been in the April one. But yeah, maybe I, it was late. But I, it was that year. Uh huh. Absolutely, it was. It was, it was that. It was that year. I remember. Remember, we do we started that bounce, and I remember saying, "Start jumping up and down." I started jumping up and down. I said, "Start jumping up and down," because we were we wanted to celebrate. Yeah, it was like a mosh pit. It was it's like a, a mosh pit, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The stomp or the bounce. That's it. it became you know, and, and certainly in the years that followed, we didn't even know the term walk off before that, really, but. But as the years followed, uh, everybody in baseball did that sort of thing. So that was that was right. always pretty cool as a Reds fan. And nobody around the world so, would know that. But so I think I think we could say the Reds. I think the Reds started it. Yes. And, and to be honest, I could be totally wrong, but I think I, I initiated it. <laughs> well, it's it's being recorded right now, so that's that's. I the know. Answer. I know it's being recorded. So let's see what my like team. Well, if say. I can get anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> They may have a different story, but I remember that for uh, sure. If I can get anybody else on here, maybe they'll confirm or deny it. I mean, I, I know Aaron Boone has a pretty important job right now, so 
I don't know if I'm going to get to talk to him. Maybe Case Man. Maybe Case Man remembers. Maybe so. Maybe so. Okay. So fast forward a little bit, and I'm going to go through some of these. These are actually all in September. You had some other good Mm -hmm. games throughout the year. But September 4th, a Saturday in Philadelphia, the old vet, uh, you beat the Phillies 22-3. to And that included two by Mr. Eddie Tobinsey himself. Um, Nine home runs. What was it? Nine home runs in the game. I mean, that's unprecedented. And and you hit two of them. I hit it. What a game. The wind, I'm telling you what, the wind was swirling that game in that bowl, that circle stadium. And it was just blowing. It was blowing out. And I, you know, I'm trying to remember who was pitching that for Philly. I think I want to say I want to say Paul Bird started the game. Um, but yeah, we we just started crushing. Uh, and I hit two homers that day, and everybody we put in, and we we pinch hit. You know, Mark Lewis he hit a grand slam. Yes. Uh, and, and Brian, I think Brian Johnson came in for me, and he hit a home run, and it just all, all these homers and. And I think it's still a, na- a National League record and tied a Major League record for nine. But the crazy thing is, people don't remember, the next day we came back and hit five more. <laughs> That's right. And That's right. we hit five more instead of two-day record of 14 homers in two days. I hit another one the next day. We won We won that game nine to seven. And uh, then we went to Chicago, and Greg Vaughn hit three homers that day, mm-hmm. I think. And so I think we stopped hitting – he, he, he kept hitting homers. But, but yeah, that was – that that was that was that that was a type of year. It's just kind of like special stuff like that. It just clicked, and you know, we weren't a big. I guess other than Vaughn, I mean, nobody else hit over thirty homers, right? Uh, and so Vaughn had like forty, what forty something, forty five, yeah, uh, forty five. And and other than that, we had we we had lots of guys in twenties, but no nobody in thirties. I don't think. No, I don't think so either. And and uh, to your point, uh, Paul Bur- uh, Bird did start that game. He, he was no slouch. He went fourteen and eight on the year. Um, no, but, but you had yeah. th- you know, the team had three off of him. He touched Chad OJ up for three home runs as well. You know, Ohio fans remember him with the Indians. Um, That's right. So yeah, you, just quite a day <laughs> that that the Reds had that day, and and it's still immortalized. If you see, if you ever see like the. Uh, the 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 programs or the media guides that the picture of you guys that you took as a group um is still always in there um yeah i i have that at home too we could it's funny that the next day we had all, all eight of us um to took a picture together I, yeah, I i got that in my office it's a really nice picture well speaking of pictures as well uh, sean casey's been hosting his own uh podcast the last couple of years and he does it on video and i saw it was a picture of the opening day lineup, basically lineup, yep. in '99, and it's it's from behind, so it gets Jack McKeon and all you guys with the backs yep. of your jerseys. And um, I actually uh, t- a little over two years ago, I, I broke and dislocated my right ankle, and so I had some time on my hands, and I ended up messaging he and Danny Graves on Twitter, and they told me it was actually a trainer or somebody who took the picture. And it uh, sure was. I, I, I got I got it at home too. I have that same photo. Okay, it's up in the up but in the I, house. It's, yeah, yeah. I tracked I tracked him down and bought it off of him. He he shipped it to me and everything. So I've got it uh, hanging up in my Reds man cave. So that's pretty cool. Uh, when you yeah. when you think about those memories. Hey, oh, to go backwards, one I didn't write down, but we talk about scoring a ton of runs. Another day it was a little bittersweet because Denny Nagel actually got hurt that day or, or ended up going on the injured list after that, but. A wild day in Colorado, uh, May nineteenth, nineteen ninety nine. You you win twenty four to twelve, and that's the day I remember because every Reds game was not on TV back then, like it is now. And um, I went to a Damon's. I don't know if you remember Damon's restaurants. Um, I went to a Damon's looking to watch the game, and even they couldn't get it on the Colorado feed. So I'm driving around mm. Ohio State's campus trying to get it on the radio, and here you guys win 24 to 12. What a day! Sean Casey had six RBIs. You know what? Now, if I if you look at the box score, I, I haven't looked at the box score. I don't know. I bet I didn't play that game. Yeah, I you did not. No, no. Uh, yeah, I, I think I remember that. I'm just like, man, because uh, I caught the probably the two games before. Mm-hmm. And this was a getaway day game on Wednesday. And, oh yeah, uh, day game. Yeah, I was like, I, I was wishing that. I was like, well, no way, everybody's getting all these runs. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that that could happen in Colorado because the other games before that probably weren't weren't as scoring like that. But we we it was a, it was a lot of scoring that game because it was a twenty four to 
12 games. 24 to 12. Brian Johnson, your backup, had uh, a three for six day with four RBI. Um, there you go. Pokey Reese hit two home runs in the game. Uh, and, uh, of course, Sean Casey that game had six RBI. So he, he went four for four with th- four for four with three walks and six RBI. What a day, huh? I know. Well, you know what? That, that's a lot of scoring. You know what? They, that could have been 90 rubies for me maybe instead of 87, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> oh, boy, you're just you're, – you're uh, standing next to Skip trying to get him to put you out there for sure. No, I was – you know what? Guess what? To be honest, when, when, when you, like as, as a catcher, when you're playing every day, when you see that, I'm glad because I can relax. I know I'm not going in. That's game. true. That's and, true. And so to me, to me, I, I, I did not care. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. That's right. That's right. Okay. So we fast forward again. Um, we, we talked about the Phillies game Monday, September twentieth. You had a four mm-hmm. for four night. Now you talk about trying to stay strong as a starting catcher. These are the dog days. Now you get into late September. You went four for four, including your twentieth home run. You were the first. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, the first catcher since uh, Johnny Bench with twenty or more. I've heard of that guy. So um, you had eight total bases that day. I did. I remember that. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I hit it. My wife hates it when I remember. So I hit a change up out of, out <laughs> and uh, got a couple of hits. I even that game. I came out. I think I came out of that game. I got a bunt hit that day too. Yes, you I, did. I watched the replay. You did. I, Jack had me sacrifice, and I don't know why. And uh, <laughs> but I sacrificed, and I got a I got a hit, and uh, I ended up I think coming out later in the game. But yeah, I, re- I remember that remember that game a- as well. So that, that that was a good game. Yeah, especially to get. I was really excited to get the twentieth homer because that's a, that that was something. Uh, milestone you, you, you kind of want to reach. Well, it was funny. You had the bunt hit, but they threw it away. They still caught it a hit, but you made, I think you reached all the way around the third base. So McKeon probably yeah, felt like he had to get you out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was a little bit tired, but yeah. that, that, that was it. That, that was a good game. Kind of like, but really that's, that's, I always tell these young kids, even I'm, I'm coaching their help college back then when we played, we had to do those little things. Sure. You know what? We yeah, could we hit home runs? Yeah, we can hit home runs and drive. But we had when it called upon, we had to get a guy over. The game called for it, and the coach wanted us to do it. We had to do it. That's right. That's right. Now they say, you know, your seven hole hitter in the big leagues probably batted third or fourth in AAA and never was asked to. So, uh, yeah, right? I, I get you. I get you. All right. So this is going to be a personal favor on my end. I'm going to bring up Sunday, September 26. You're having that battle with the Astros, and even as you mentioned, the Mets to see who's going to make. The, the division winner in the wild card spot. You're at home mm-hmm. on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I remember this game. It was just when I first started dating my now wife. We've been together all these years. We had just started dating. We decided to come down for the game from Columbus. Um, and we end up, we bought tickets. We sit there and there was a little old lady and she had driven down from Columbus by herself. She told us the story of her her, her husband had died, and they used to come down mm. for the Sunday matinees, and she just didn't want to miss out on another one. Uh, I think that was probably the last home one of the game of the year. And uh, and we sat with her and talked to her the whole game. In the bottom of the 12th inning, you got things started with a one-out single. Brian Johnson walked, and then Pokey Reese hits a walk-off home run. Yeah, that 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 that, that was some good series with St. Louis. And because and, a couple things – um, you know, McGuire was hitting a lot of homers that year, and, and St. Louis came into town, so we had a lot of fans at, at the game, right? And um, so yeah, that that was that was a huge game with 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 with, with Pokey hit, hitting that homer, and and, and that, that that was that was super huge, and um, and, and then also there was another game that I don't know if it was that game before or. Or the the game after is is there was a we 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 beat we beat the Cardinals. Yeah, the next day you and, won nine to seven. Actually, you swept the Cardinals in four games that that series uh, five four okay, six one. The, yeah. And what was interesting about that game that that we won, I think nine to seven, or I think it was that game. It was one of those games that series is that it was at the end of the year. Mark McGuire came into town that game. He hit a homer upper deck left field. Mm-hmm. 
And if it, and and so if he hit a home run, I think he hit like a sixty first, sixtieth. Yeah, that was a sixty first. The day before, he hit a sixtieth in that Pokey Reese game. So yeah, your your memory is right. great. And, and so this game, all right, we, it was because every game for the Reds, this is the end of the year. We're fighting for the playoffs. It was like a playoff atmosphere. And I remember, is at the bottom of the eighth, Demetri Young was on second base. We're down a run, and I I come up to the plate. And and the and the the crowd is chanting Eddie <laughs> yes. Eddie Eddie and I was like I was like oh my gosh I was I was thinking to myself okay let me just make it nerve make this simple now I was thinking I'll just try to get a base up the middle to get Dimitri in and the pitcher hung a slider on a, like a two two count and I I had an upper deck homer to right field okay to, to to put us ahead and we ended up winning that game so I don't know if that that's the game I hit a home run. Um, you know, but the, it, it was right that same time when Pokey we were playing the Cardinals and Pokey hit a hit a, hit a big homer and things like that. So the next day, I, I did the same thing with McGuire went upper deck left field and I went upper deck right field. Well, I will tell you, uh, I told you the story of the old lady and then my now wife. It, I picked my girl, then girlfriend up and twirled her around when Pokey hit that home run. And I will say yeah. to you, uh, you know. Eddie Tobinsey was my my wife's favorite player. She she her first favorite player as a kid was Paul O'Neill, and then it was you. So oh, you've got that going that. for you. She loved Eddie Tobinsey when we'd watch you play. So uh, that was pretty cool. Um, I told her this morning. I asked her she if she had anything I wanted to ask you about, and she said no, not really. But I said I'm going to tell him you you were he was your favorite player. So <laughs> well, that's awesome, and I appreciate that. And I did. And, P- and Pokey Reese had a great year that year. He did. He did. As you mentioned earlier, all the younger guys, uh, they all kind of had played up to their their potential uh, even earlier than we would have thought for some of them. And I know Pokey even had, it was the year before that Larkin was hurt at the beginning of the year and he started shortstop and had a tough game, four errors in the opening day game. And yeah. and certainly uh, certainly he became... Then he, about, then he won about four gold gloves after that. Absolutely. So like, I think he did okay. <laughs> all right. He so, a couple of two or three. Yeah, he was, he was something else. So so we're going to move forward to some something that's not as fun to reminisce about, that cold yeah. weekend in Milwaukee. Um, yeah, I, I was a uh, student radio back then at Ohio state. So we did the, the football games on the air. And, um, I remember your Saturday game, you know, I just remember trying to tune in and I think you had rain delays and I know Sunday you had rain delays all day and you got stuck playing mm-hmm. late at night. Talk about the vibe of the team that weekend and kind of, you know, boy, it just felt like you could just grab it and it just, it just wasn't meant to be. We, we were so confident Seth going into Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. Um, because no, all, all all we had to do, all we had to do, we just we just knew going into that weekend because we're watching Houston play, we're watching New York play, and um, we just had to win two out of three. Sure, we went two. We went two out of three. We're in. Whether we win the division or we're a wild card, uh, we're we're going to be in, and that's all we had to do. And the the first game, you know, we had a lead going going into to the the bottom of the ninth. Uh, we ended up, um, you know, given we ended up losing that lead and losing in extra innings. I remember that was tough because mm-hmm. uh, that was the game we wanted to win. Because the next game, the second game, we got we just we got beat. They sure. beat us pretty yeah. good. And um, and and then what was horrible is is we the last game there was a rain delay, so we're watching Houston play. They win. We're watching the Mets play. They won. And we're like, oh my gosh! So if they would have lost. That that could have changed a lot of things. So we're stuck. We're like, we have to pitch our best pitcher. We have to pitch Harnish. Mm-hmm. We're going to try to. You know, we're trying to save Harnish, our workhorse, for, for even for even the the, the maybe a playing game, or or even the first or wild card game. But uh, but it, it didn't work out that way. We we had to pitch. We had, we had to win. It was a must win. So we had to pitch our best. So uh, Pete was that guy. We we won. We won handily that day, and we did we did we did our job. And we were excited to come home. And I know that they said we're playing at home. It was the schedule. The game was scheduled for like a twelve thirty game, one right. o'clock game. But we got home at six in the morning. Sure. And and we ended up playing a night game. And we weren't, you know, we and obviously Leiter pitched, pitched an amazing, amazing game. I got a chance to start that game, and I did fine against them. I think I walked, and I hit a line drive in second, and, and they just we just couldn't score. And no. We just couldn't score, and um, 
and then lighter lighter did his job and we just uh it was i seth it was tough i going through that september the way we were playing the way we were winning i didn't i didn't care what the scenario was that i thought there's nothing going to stop us from getting into playoffs mm-hmm. and and i was i was su- i was going to be super excited personally because i was like now i get to be that guy i get to catch i don't have to, i'm not going to be behind beneath their santiago 95 Right. You know, and, th- and things like that. I get, I get to be the guy because I was the guy all year. And I was excited for that opportunity, and I, I thought for sure there was nothing that was going to stop us. Well, and the tragedy of it was, and you know, I guess you looking back on it, you can't say it's anybody's fault, but you, you had the the big rain delay on Saturday night. You played t- deep into the day on Sunday, and then you don't get home until so early the next morning. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Bud Selig had sent the Mets. They they played their game, and he sent them to Cincinnati. They were already in bed before you even got on the plane to, to fly back to Cincinnati. And um, but I do remember I bought tickets at a, a local Ticketmaster in Columbus, and three of us came down. That that stadium was electric for that game. Um, it, it was such a good was. thing. And you know why we were so excited about getting into the playoffs is because that you know. Back then, there's only one wild card team, so there's mm-hmm. four. There's four teams going to go. We, we had, we had that year. We had the Braves, obviously, and the the Braves, the Astros, and the D-backs, and and then obviously the Mets were the wild card team, and um, we won the, those three won won the divisions. And um, if we if we, I think I think the Mets started out playing the D-backs. Yes, I want to say. Yep, and so. And we were eight and one against the D-backs. You certainly were. Yep. We were eight and one, and and if we got past it, we even played Houston. We were like nine and four against them, and and so we owned those two. We were excited. We owned those teams during the, the regular season, and those teams that you know Arizona won a hundred games, and, and boy, if we didn't beat up on Houston the way we did, they would have kind of ran away with the division more and won a hundred games. And but obviously the Braves owned us that year. I think we're they beat us eight out of nine yeah. times, and, and so we knew our, we would have struggled with them a little bit. It'd been tough, but we knew if we got if we got in, we were excited about our matchups going into the first round. Yeah, it would have been something else, but but it just I guess wasn't meant to be. But because it- because within our own division, those two teams, Arizona, Houston, we. We we dominated them that that year. Right, you thought you had you definitely had a chance, and of course, us as fans, we were still uh, snake bitten from the Braves because in '92, I think the Reds had 90 wins and didn't make the playoffs, and then uh, of course '95 being swept by the Braves, and we yeah. always, uh, you know, with them being on TV all the time, and it always just felt like they were that whole decade. They were just kind of in control and. I remember in 98, you guys were so young, and I remember watching you play the Braves and trying to – it was almost like a measuring stick. So, um, yeah, that yep. was something else too. Hey, I've kept you a lot longer than I intended, but really quickly, if you're willing, I'd like to run down a few of the teammates and maybe just get a few thoughts about oh, each gosh, of them. Oh, gosh, yeah, let, let, let's, let's do it. Hey, so I'm just looking at the baseball reference. Uh, we'll go through the regular lineup. You were at catcher, and then Sean Casey. Talk about him a little bit. Oh my gosh, Sean Casey, me and him were buds. He, actually, he's the godfather of my youngest son, wow. Matthew. We call him Chewy. So, yeah, <laughs> he's doing awesome. And uh, the only thing I feel bad for Case is it gets Al Leiter. We had a guy at third with one out, and he couldn't get him in, mm-hmm. and that would have been his 100th, 100th ribby. That's right, because the, so, the game's the stats counted. So, yeah. The stat, the stats counted, and Sean Casey drove in 99 twice and yeah. never driven in 100 in his career. So, I was really. Really excited for him, but no, he was, he was a pleasure, man. He was just, you know, just the way he played hard and, you know, just with his infectious attitude, you know, just kind of, he did a lot of things. He kept us loose, but also he was, uh, he was a force to be reckoned with at the plate. Certainly was 332 that year. We spoke a little bit about Pokey Reese. I thought I'd share, I was at a game uh, against the Cardinals and I believe it might've been the only hit of the game of the game given up by the Reds, but uh, a, a fly ball it goes off the heel of Mike Cameron's glove. But Pokey ran out there, picked it up off the turf, off the bounce, fired it in, and the, the Reds. I assume Larkin tagged out JD Drew at second base. Just he yeah. was so good with that arm for a second baseman. We hadn't seen anything. I like tell that. you what, I tell you before he, you know, before before him we had Brett Boone mm-hmm. at second base. Yeah, the best. And, yeah. I, and Brett Boone was awesome. 
he, he was awesome. Gold Glover too. He won gold gloves. And then Pokey took over and like, he got the balls that yeah. Brett didn't get to. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, his arm, you know, and obviously he could play short. He's a natural shortstop. And no, just Pokey just made it look so easy. And you just took it. You just took him for granted. Him and Barry, as soon as the ball is hit, there's like the way they turn double plays and, and just kind of with Pokey's range going, especially going to his right at second base, really helped Barry Larkin out to where he could he could cheat over in the hole a little right. bit. And it just made him, made him a better fielder. Yeah, and of course, the Battle of Ohio back then and me being from – uh, up in Columbus at the time, we had to worry about people talking about Vizquel and Alomar up in Cleveland, and and I remember that year too. It just felt like, hey, we've got ours too. So, uh, uh, but Pokey hit 285. He had 38 stolen bases that year, yep. so he he pulled his weight at, at the plate as well, which was a big concern going in. Um, well, I think about it too. I, if, if you look at live, I think he, he, Jack, him, and Mike Cameron during the year were our leadoff guys. Yep. Both of them and, had 38 yeah. steals. Yep. And, and to be honest, if you if you tried to do it all over again, I, you probably want to put Barry more up in the leadoff one or two hole because you think about Barry, he's our best player. You want him to get the most at bats of the year. Sure. But because Barry's batting fifth most of the year behind Greg, but uh, Barry was was clutch. You, you know, Greg, this way he gave protection to Vonnie. And, you know, and so th th we, we needed Barry there in five hole. We'll talk a little bit more about Barry. He was, until Vaughn came along, the elder statesman on the team at that point. But he at 35, he still had a great year that year. Um, what did he mean to you as a, a player and as a teammate? Well, yeah, that, that was the year he won, he won MVP, I'm sure, if I remember 95 right. actually was, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Ninety five. Right. Ninety five. And in fact, it was the next year or so he had a better year where he hit thirty homers. Exactly. 30-30. 30, 30. <laughs> 30, 30, 30. But but Barry Larkin, uh, he was out of all the players I play with, he was um the best leader I played with. The fact I say that the fact is is this. Um early early on with the Reds, you know, we, we we would take infield like every single day. And and when I was with the Indians my last year, we never took infield during his regular season. We would take it all the time, the Reds, and he would show up. Mm -hmm. He'd show up every day, take infield. And when Pokey Reese was first got there, he was learning to play second, second or playing short. He had to come out for early work. Barry would be there. You know, Barry would always show up and do the work. And, 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 you know, stuff that he expect from other players, he would, he would do it himself first. That's awesome. Um, and, and when, when he spoke, we listened, um, he, he played hurt all the time. He played pretty much every single game. Uh, if he didn't play, you, you knew he, there was something going on. And, and so, yeah, he does. He, he is, he is definitely Mr. Red for us and um he, he is the leader and um uh, boy and he definitely is a hall of famer absolutely sure. absolutely um at third well base deserving. yeah third base uh, that year aaron boone he had come up a little bit earlier than that played with his brother some but then he takes over at third base uh again one of these guys that he was only 26 you had that group of guys from ages 23 to 26 that just really made impacts what kind of teammate was aaron Aaron is is very very athletic. Obviously, he is by a very athletic build, athletic body, great talent, very smart. So very very smart. So he, he's all about position. He knows where to position. He's always talking baseball, always talking hitting, talking things, talking during the game, and talking. And he he just, he was a, he just got better and better the more he played because he he soak up every mm -hmm. everything. So he was. He, he he was awesome to have on the field because he he's a gamer he's a competitor. He was and fiery. He yeah. As, yeah, he was fiery too. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Brett, he's different than Brett. Brett was really a lot, really vocal, really fiery. Aaron was was that, but to a lesser extent. Okay, you know, yeah, he's you know in 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 that way. But they're totally two different players. But man, he was um he he, he could, boy he could hit the ball all over the field. Um, play smart, great third base, and just you just make 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 the plays that you're supposed to do, and, and and make some really good plays. We already talked about Greg Vaughn quite a bit, but uh, his power was definitely felt in that lineup. Oh yeah, for sure, and you know he was the only guy who drove in over a, a hundred runs that year, and 
he was definitely he was the force you know he was when he was hot he would carry us for sure for 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 many days and for for weeks at, at a time but he would he he brought the expectations even when he wasn't going good he expect expected expected us to win and he would find a way to, to to do things and you know what and you know what he did he, to me he did just fine in the outfield too i mean he, he's supposed to he got caught the balls he's supposed to catch um and i love i loved it man he he fight he fire us up you know like if we're down in, in a game in the middle of the game the fifth sixth seventh inning he's chirping on the on the bench walking up and down and just kind of he, he, he motivated us okay. for sure yeah absolutely and mike cameron we spoke about him too he, but but i think you know he only played the one year in cincinnati but reds fans certainly remember that one year dude you, you know what again I think it's just total athlete. He just he does everything kind of very well. Obviously, his glove out in center field unmatched in a lot of ways. I mean, he get the ball. He, he's a Gold Glove center fielder. He could play. Um, you knew he was he, average wise. He wasn't going to hit for a high average, but when he hit, he's going to hit with some power, drive in some some key runs once in a while. Drop you run into some balls, but you know what? He he can steal bases at any time. Um, you know, but you got to, you got to, you got to, you got you to gotta live with, with the strikeouts with the, along with the walks. Mm-hmm. He'll, he'll get on base. He had a good on base percentage and good enough. And, uh, and, but yeah, he was, he, he was good. He, no he, doubt. He, he was, he was, he was amazing in an outfield. And so with him in center field, um, really solidified, you know, cause we, cause we, we would play when we had Vonnie out there and, and probably, you know, we would play guys like, we got we had Tucker, great outfielder. We had Tucker. We had Jeffrey Hammonds who could play some outfield, did really well. But obviously, Demetri Young would kind of be be a kind of that right fielder, a little bit of everything too. Sure, I was going to bring that up. Tucker, Young, and Hammonds, and 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 Dimitri played some first base. Like I know, even against Randy yeah. Johnson or somebody like that when when McKeon <laughs> would sit Casey because uh, uh, Dimitri was a switch hitter. But but Jack McKeon found a way to play. Jeffrey Hammonds, Demetri Young, and Michael Tucker all 120 plus games a year. That was that's really amazing. Yeah, I, I agree, and that that was the catalyst for us. If you only have a guy like Greg Vaughn driving in 100, and you know, shot, you know, Case Van was at 100, and I think I was third on the team in, in, in RBIs, and you know, I'm not playing every day, mm-hmm. and so, and then to have guys like Demetri Young, Hammonds, and Tucker. The production they have with with the, with the double digit homers and and all around fifty RBIs, so that that is a quality player. That's a big time player if you add up all of, you combine those numbers. That's so that's a guy driving in probably close to uh, ninety, a hundred runs and and you know twenty five to thirty homers right there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it was it was such a memorable season, and you and I have talked now uh, at an hour. <laughs> uh, I did not intend for it to be this long, as I said, but but I've really, really enjoyed talking with you, Eddie, and and I really appreciate you coming on. Seth, it's been a great pleasure, and you know what it made made my day. Don't get a chance to talk about it too much, but that was it brought up some great memories. Thanks. Okay, thank you.